Frank, thank you very much. If I'm going to be named after a rock star, I want it to be John Entwistle or some other bass player. Okay? That's my only request. I'm not a singer, and I'm not going to gyrate up here. But, uh, but if I could become known as a bass player, I'd be. That's my dream in life. Okay. So remember that. So call me. Uh, I don't know. I'll even settle for Paul McCartney. He's a great bass player. <clears throat> okay. So we're going to talk about the economics of labor, labor markets, wages, how wages are set, how wages rise, what intervention does to labor markets. Uh, and um, ask questions along the way if you wish, if you need something clarified or you know, there's an answer you need to know sort of right then to understand what I'm talking about, please uh, raise your hand. Try to keep it on track. It's tempting, I know, for uh, issues to come up that kind of draw us off the main thoroughfare. And the cost of that, of course, is then I don't get to cover some things I feel like I should cover. So, and there's a lot to try to jam into about an hour. I want to leave time for Q&A. So a little discipline on all our parts is, will help. So I want to talk about labor. Uh, and I should start off with a uh, bit of a preface here. Sometimes I think in free market discussions, I don't think it's so much intentional, but I, uh, it comes off, there's all, there seems to be a sort of an animosity toward labor. I think it begins with uh, the idea, that, uh, which, is, which is correct, that unions, when unions are aligned with government, you get massive intervention in the free market, violation of freedom of contract, freedom of association, and so that it's not only morally offensive, but it has serious uh, economic consequences, unemployment and things of that nature, which I'm going to talk about. So beginning with this animosity toward compulsory unionism or state-aligned unionism, sometimes I get the sense that spills over onto labor generally or workers generally. There's almost this animosity. Uh, like I said, I think it's not so much in the uh, scholarly literature, but in a lot of popular free market writing. And it's... it's uh, like I said, I don't think it's intentional, but I think we should watch out for that. I think, first of all, it alienates potential allies to, to our side. Uh, we don't want, we shouldn't get uh, a reputation, we shouldn't want a reputation as being anti-worker, anti-labor. And I think part of the, the reason this has, has happened is that for many, many years, of course, there's been a huge animosity on the other side toward employers, toward business, toward capital. And I think in an effort to sort of balance things, there's been an overemphasis on behalf of uh, the, the, you know, the business employer side, and, and that, I think, leads sometimes to this unintentional anti-labor tone of the, that some free market uh, people take. So I think I just try to be on the outlook uh, for that, and I try to make sure that in this lecture, no one could take that uh, impression away. Um, I mean, both, so both sides, if we want to talk about them as sides, both sides are trying to get as much as they can for the least cost. I mean, we all try to do that. We already had a talk on praxeology, right? Uh, I didn't sit through that, but I, I have a feeling I know uh, what Professor Swick gave that one, right? What, uh, what gets covered there. And of course, in any, any human action, we're trying to get the most bang for the buck. And here I'm using buck uh, in, a, in a, just a metaphorical sense. In other words, we want, we want the, the biggest return for the least cost, the least expenditure. In human action, we have a goal. And we want to economize on means. We wouldn't, we wouldn't uh, unnecessarily use more means, more resources, more time, more effort than necessary to get what we want. I mean, that's just, the, that uh, grows out, that knowledge grows out of the, uh, the axiom of action. That's how we make sense of it. So business, of course, an employer, I say business, is always people too, right? These aggregates don't exist. They're, they're, meta they're metaphors, they're abstractions. People who uh, seek to employ other people in a productive enterprise, of course would like to get as much effort they can, as they can get out of their workers at, for the least amount that they can get away with. Get away with them simply in, in a market sense. In other words, the, you don't offer more than you think you need to get the person to work for you. And, and the, by the same token, on the other side, the, uh, the, the prospective employee is trying to get as much as he can for what's expected of him. So everybody is doing the same thing in a sense. So there's no reason to disparage one or the other. There was a famous, I think it was George Meany who ran um, the AFL-CIO for many years. I think it was him, but it was, it was some uh, well-known prominent labor leader who was asked, you know, one time during, I guess during a dispute, labor dispute, you know, what do you want? And he answered in one word. He said, more. And that's often used by the free market side as some sort of disparagement of, uh, of, the, of workers or of a union. But what, what's wrong with that? Business wants more, too. They want more profits. They... They want more 
of the return of return of a return on their investment. Nothing. There's nothing wrong with that. So we shouldn't use that as a uh, as a, as a way to put down uh, you know one, either either side. The problem comes in the means. You know, if you're going to if you if you're getting trying to get the government to get you things that you cannot get through voluntary exchange, now we got a problem, and that's what we need to talk about. It's not the wanting more; it's how you want to get it that that results in the problem. Okay, that's that's a preface that kind of jumped me ahead. I want to get back to basics now. So I want to begin with a quotation, which I think is uh, I like a lot from Benjamin Tucker. Benjamin Tucker was a leading libertarian thinker in the late 19th century, early 20th century. He published a very lively magazine called Liberty. Not, not related to the liberty that's being published these days, if you know that magazine. Uh, and this was a hotbed of in, sort of internal libertarian debate among various strains of libertarianism. There were natural rights people. There were the uh, egoists, the, who were advocates of uh, Max Stirner's uh, philosophy, if anybody under, knows what that is. He wrote a book called The Ego and His, and His Own, where it doesn't stress, it, it rejected natural law, natural rights, so yet constant, vigorous debates, very interesting because thrashing things out, very formative. Uh, we've inherited the, the benefits of those debates. They argued patents, whether patents and copyrights, intellectual property were legitimate or not in a free society. Great stuff, great stuff. A lot of, you can find stuff online, uh, and I think a lot of it's been, uh, I don't know if a whole run of the magazine has been uh, put online, but you can find some stuff. But anyway, that's a little background. Tucker. I want to read this quote from Tucker, which I, which I like. He says, It is not enough, however, true to say that if a man has labor to sell, he must find someone with money to buy it. <clears throat> it is necessary to add the much more important truth that if a man has labor to sell, he has a right to a free market in which to sell it. A market in which no one shall be prevented by restrictive laws from honestly obtaining money to buy it. If the man with labor to sell has not this free market, then his labor is violated and his liberty virtually taken from him. So what Tucker is stressing here is that uh, the worker needs a free market as much as anybody else does. I mean, that seems like a fairly common sense point. That shouldn't be terribly controversial here. But what he was uh, taking pains to stress here is that any intervention on the side of business, and historically, you know, this might be, might, might have changed to some extent in, in more recent times, but historically, intervention has tended to be on the side of uh, the business side. You had franchises, monopolies, guilds, uh, and uh, state favors from the king or from the government, uh, which, was a, which was a form of protectionism, protected companies and firms and industries from competition, trade restrictions, for example, from uh, imports. This tended to protect business. And his, his point was if you protect, if you reduce competition through law, through the government, you're also reducing the cloud of workers, right? Workers benefit, workers are at their maximum cloud when there's free and open competition because that means other people are bidding for their services. That means self employment opportunities are at their maximum because the government is not in any way. Making, uh, putting up barriers for self uh, self employment, and and uh, that means the more options, the more the worker has has clout, right? Because he can turn down any given employer and say, "I have other opportunities. I don't need to, I don't like, I don't need to accept your conditions, or you know, I don't think you're paying me enough. I can go somewhere else." To the extent that the government is is in effect reducing the number of options for workers through corporatism, let's say, which which uh, uh, makes it difficult for new competition to start or for a small business to get bigger, you're cutting down on the opportunities for uh, individual workers and that means their bargaining power is weakened and uh, they have fewer opportunities, therefore they have to, they're more likely to take what they can get because they don't have as many opportunities. So they're in a, you could, there's exploitation. That's exploitation not in the Marxist sense, but in the status sense. And uh, historically there's been an alliance uh, between uh, government and business. Uh, we don't think of that th so much these days because, you know, in a, in a, uh, in a, in a democratic society, uh, lots of people have an opportunity to get their hands on the powers of government and use it to exploit. So it's business kind of lost uh, the monopoly it's had uh, historically. Uh, so this is, what, this is what Tucker is stressing. So let's go back to the very beginning and not even talk about a worker in an economy. Let's just look at the... the uh, where uh, these concepts even come from, and we'll do that in the traditional way that, e that economists like to do this, by looking at Robinson Crusoe on a, alone on an island. Because I think when we begin to understand 
the, the nature of work and returns and things like that, once we start looking at it in a market context, it's, it's much clearer. So by looking at it at you know, the Crusoe level, we sort of clear away a lot of uh, um, the things that obscure uh, what's really going on. So imagine, I mean, first of all, let's, uh, let's establish one point if it hasn't already come up. The, the human race was born into poverty. Okay? I know a lot of people wring their hands and do studies on what causes poverty. You, you know, the government and, and university departments constantly turning out, uh, you know, uh, studies. S answering the question, or at least attempting to answer the question, you know, why is there poverty? What causes poverty? But uh, that's a little silly because, you know, poverty is, is the equivalent to darkness. You don't say what causes darkness. Darkness is the absence of light. So poverty is the absence of wealth. The question is why is there wealth? Okay, this is not an original insight of mine. Uh, lots of free market people have pointed this out. But for some reason, it doesn't get through to our opponents. They're still looking for the causes of poverty. Uh, so we're born, mankind was born poor. I live in the state of Arkansas. And uh, for, I guess for, for some period of time before Bill Clinton became governor of Arkansas, the, uh, the, the motto on the uh, license tag was um, land of opportunity, which is a very forward-looking, right, optimistic uh, slogan. Nice, that's a nice slogan. Land of opportunity. Sometime during the Clinton years as governor, it, it was changed to the natural state. Now, in light of what I'm saying, mankind being born into poverty, the natural state wasn't so great. Now, of course, they didn't mean it quite that way. They meant, you know, a lot of forests and, and uh, natural resources and parks and things like that. And and state by state, they meant, you know, like one of the 50 states. But if you, in light of what I'm saying, the natural state has another meaning. And maybe his policies, if, if we had stuck with them long enough, might have taken us back to the, to the natural state that I'm using it. Meaning abject poverty, okay? Think of the condition of the earliest uh, 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 creatures that we would identify as human beings. They, they're, you know, they had a tough life, okay? It wasn't so great. They uh, didn't have iPods and stuff like that. Now, I know you're all young and... You, Young people, and even people my age, have very little historical perspective. They don't realize that we are in a month. If you look at all the people that have ever lived, we are in a very, very tiny elite. I don't just mean in the United States. I mean in the, in the whole world. We are so wealthy compared to most people that came before us that it you know, would blow the mind of anybody just a, you know, a couple hundred years back, or a hundred years back, to bring them to the, the, the present and let them look around. They would be just absolutely astounded. So uh, we should keep that in mind. Okay, so we got Crusoe on the, on the island. He's by himself, okay? Friday hasn't shown up yet because he, he complicates things. That, that increases the population 100%, and, you know, then you got an overpopulation problem already. So let's have a look at Crusoe by himself. Now, it's very, very simple, okay? Cause and effect is quite clear there. I'm assuming now there's not a lot of uh, ready-to-eat stuff, right, hanging around, like the, okay? You can't just pick apples off trees, okay? It's a pretty barren island, so... Uh, if he goes, it's very simple, the relationship between income, right, between his labor and his income, right? No work, no income. Very simple. If he gets up one morning and says, I don't feel like working today, he can't expect anything to come in. Okay, there's no minimum wage, there's no paid holidays, you know, all these complications of modern life are easily uh, cleared away. No such thing. He works or he dies, and from, from this story, we can get, the, we can get a good bit of uh, economic concepts, like capital goods. For example, let's say, let's say his best chance uh, in the beginning of getting anything to eat is to stand in, uh, on, you know, uh, in the, uh, as far out as he can go in the, uh, in the water there and start grabbing at fish. Okay, that's not a terribly efficient way to, to get fish, but you know, if you're starving and, it's, and you can't even take time to do anything else, you may, you may do that. Uh, but sooner or later, he's going to decide that there's got to be a better way. So he may start thinking about uh, making something, like a spear or a net or uh, a fishing pole with a, with a, um, you know, with a, uh, a hook. So he's got to, um, and he, if he uh, calculates it's going to take him some period of time, he's going to have to, uh, and, he, and he may need to eat during that period of time, he's going to figure he better catch, work extra hard and store up some fish to carry him over during the time when he's not catching fish, okay? This is not a lecture in capital theory, although you can see how it's kind of tending that way. He's going to need to store up some consumption goods, right, during the period where he's making this round, doing this roundabout uh, uh, path toward more fish. He would only do it if he expects to get more fish. Anyway, so he's, he's got to look at how he wants to spend his time 
and calculate what his income is going to be, namely fish or whatever it is he, he's planning to consume. And he'll work up until the point where uh, the next uh, 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 increment of output from an hour's, of wor hour's worth of work, let's say, uh, is no longer worth it. He now values some other way to use his time, or he may value not working at all, but spending some time in leisure. So this is an important point. That when, you, when you're thinking about how to spend your time in labor, you, you, know, you may say, I can do task A, B, or C, but there's also another alternative, which is not a form of labor at all, but uh, leisure, taking leisure. So unlike other resources where the opportunity costs are how to employ various things, uh, you have a choice about yourself. You can choose to spend some time not employed at all, right? Just lying in the hammock, uh, resting. That's a, I'll say a little more about leisure as we go. <clears throat> Okay, so he's making these calculations, right? Marginal product. In other words, how much, if I spend the next hour fishing, how many fish am I going to have? It, ha, is the enjoyment of having those fish, does that outweigh spending the time in my hammock? Those are the kinds of calculations he's going to be making. They aren't, they aren't num numerical calculations. I use that word sort of metaphorically. They're subjective, right? They're set subjective evaluations of, how, of uh, is the return doing this better than the return doing that, or leisure, the return to leisure, you can think of it as. So you can see how marginal utility and all that uh, works into this. Now it's important to point out that w labor in an economic sense or perhaps theological sense is not just sweating, right? It's not just exertion, physical activity that, that gets you to sweat. That's not labor in, in, a, in, a, uh, in an economic or praxeological sense. Uh, let me read a quote from you, uh, to you, and um, I think it's a very interesting quote. And tell me, who do you think said this? Um, obviously, if I'm asking you this, you're, you're already thinking, okay, it's got to be someone I don't expect. So you'll start thinking of unlikely people. But anyway, see, see, uh, see what you come up with. A thing cannot have value if it is not a useful article. If it is not useful, then the labor it contains is also useless. Does not count as labor, and hence does not create value. Yeah, no, why, why are people guessing Marx? You should be guessing Menger, Bambavark, uh, Mises, Rothbard. Wouldn't that, doesn't that sound like, the, it is Marx, but it doesn't sound like the opposite of Marx. Marx is an advocate of the labor theory of value. I mean, he's famous for that, which he inherited, by the way, from uh, relative good guys, right? Uh, Adam Smith and Ricardo and Mill. They, they were advocates. Economics in, in, the modern, in modern times gets started with this huge misconception, the labor theory of value, right? That the, the value of a thing comes from the labor it took to make the thing. That's in the, in, now frozen in that thing. And Marx took that and took it in a direction that uh, Smith and Ricardo and Mill, I assume, didn't intend, namely that the, the worker is exploited in the marketplace. Because since he's not getting the full price of the product when it's sold, right? Because otherwise, because there's profit to the owner of the business, that must be taken away from the, if labor is the source of value, anything the, the employer gets must have been taken away from the worker. But here he is making a very interesting point. He's basing the whole, his whole uh, theory of value on usefulness. Well, that's a subjective thing, right? You might find something useful, and I'd say, well, no, nah, I don't see any use for that. That's perfectly possible. It happens every day. It doesn't mean he's right and I'm wrong. His situation, in your situation, you find whatever it is useful. And in my particular situation, I have no use for it. That's... That's what we mean by uh, subjective value. Um, but he's right. Marx is right in this case. And I found this quote, by the way, in a footnote by uh, Eugen von uh, Bombeverk, who was like the second generation of Austrian economists, who wrote a big three-volume work, which we have somewhere up there, called Capital and Interest, and who spent a good deal of his professional life refuting Marx's system. I mean, he dealt at death blows in a couple of different... Um, at a couple, in a couple different ways, and I'll, and I'll talk about his, the exploitation theory, uh, which is where um, uh, Bomberg inflicted so much damage on the Marxian system. But in a footnote, he quotes Marx, and I hadn't known about this quote until I was reading Bomberg, and I was just kind of stunned that here's Marx uh, uh, acknowledging that labor is not labor if the product of that effort is not something useful to people. That's a pretty big concession, I think, on Marx's part. Anyway, it's a little interesting uh, side note, but, but it's the point I want to make. For labor in a praxeological sense, or economic sense, to really to be labor, there has to be something that comes out as a result of it that people find useful in the marketplace, or at least ultimately useful. 
I mean, if you're mining iron ore, you know, you and I don't buy iron ore, right? When's the last time you were in the store asking for a quantity of iron ore? Probably never. But you buy lots of things that originated, in part, in, with iron ore. So the person who's mining ore, if it's making sense economically, in other words, if someone's paying him and, and, uh, and, uh, and it's moving along the production line to where it finally becomes a washing machine, then we can say that that person's labor is productive of something that ultimately uh, uh, consumers value. Because under the, in, the, in the Austrian conception, I don't know if this has already been discussed, but one of Menger's very important insights when he launches Austrian economics in the 1870s, uh, Karl Menger, is that the value of the factors of production, right, the materials, the labor, the land, the, you know, the buildings, everything, doesn't have value in itself. I mean, this is another challenge to the labor theory of value. It's not, it's, the inputs don't have value in themselves. They get their value from the value of the output. So if consumers value things, then all the things you need to make that gets imputed backwards on, onto the things. Imagine for a moment a machine that could only make one thing, widgets. I mean, this is a bit of a strange uh, example, but it will make the point. So you've got a widget-making machine, that's all it's good for, except, say, scrap, you know, very low value as scrap metal. And people really like widgets. People are buying widgets, you know, in the millions every year. So that, that, the machine's going to have value, right? Now, let's say something comes on the market which is uh, better than a widget. It just knocks widgets out. Nobody wants widgets anymore. We now have something else. Now, remember, this machine is only good for one thing, widgets, or very cheap scrap. Is that going to maintain the value that it had previously before widgets got knocked, you know, out of the, out of the box because, for the, because of the new innovation? No, it's not. Right? It took its value from the value of the widgets. It's totally dependent on how much consumers want the, the product, the end product. And so something that's not good at making anything is not going to have market value except, like I said, scrap. You could always, metal, you can always melt down and turn it into something else. But, but it's not going to have nearly the value that it had. So the same is true for labor. If you imagine a person who could only do one thing, you know, thank goodness this is not generally true. Uh, if a person could only do one thing, and that uh, had no value in the marketplace, that, 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 that person's labor services would have zero value in the marketplace. But like I said, luckily people are able to do more than one thing. Okay, so I want to establish that labor is not just sweating. Okay? And this is all tied in with subjective value because it's consumers who are subjectively deciding what, whether they find something useful or not, whether it fits in with their, their purposes, their day-to-day -day purposes. And something that was very useful yesterday could become fairly useless to most people uh, tomorrow just because their taste changed or something, compet some competitive uh, product comes along or something uh, you know, along, along those lines. It's not objective. This was the problem with the, the classical economics uh, school. They saw wealth as something objective. It's in the thing. It wasn't so much in, in, all, in us and our purposes and all that. It was somehow inherent in the thing. And that led them off on a bad track and Menger but Menger, Menger identified that and said, you know, I don't want to toss all the classical economics out. I just want to fix some serious problems with it and get it onto this track. And that's what Austrian economics uh, does. Although I don't think they appreciated how different Austrian economics was from the classicals in the beginning. It became more and more obvious with the socialist calculation debate and other things. Okay, so back to labor. You know, one of the things that uh, threw the uh, classicals off and the reason they looked for labor in, uh, as the source of value is that they thought when two people traded things, that they were trading equivalent things, in some sense equivalent. So if I trade an, an apple for an orange with someone, the, the, the classicals assumed that we were trading equal values. They talked about a trade in e equivalence. Uh, Smith talks about this. But the question is, was then, how is an apple and an orange, how are they equivalent? You know, they look different, the colors are different, the weight may be different, the shape could be different. Uh, an apple is certainly not an orange, so in what sense are they equal? And the classical economists eliminated everything but one thing, labor. They said, okay, it must be labor. It must have been the, the amount of labor that it took to make the apple is equal to the amount of labor to, that it took to produce the orange. And so they couldn't think of anything else. And so the big mistake they made, which uh, the Austrian school fixes, is that equivalents are not traded. That is the whole root of the problem. The premise was wrong. As Ayn Rand would say, check your premises, right? 
You shouldn't have been looking for equivalence because there's no equival equivalency. When pe when, in fact, when two people trade, that's a sign that they're not equal. The two things are not equal. They wouldn't trade otherwise. If you had an, you had an apple and I had an apple and we both saw them as identical apples, would we bother to trade? What would we even be wasting our time for? Now, if we saw them as different, you know, I like the color better, or it looked a little more ripe to me. Th those are now subjective differences that um, could cause us to make a trade. But if we both agreed that they were identical, like if you had a, a newly fresh, crisp dollar bill, and I have a newly fresh, crisp dollar bill, you know, why would we even be talking about trading? It wouldn't make any sense. Yes, yeah, of course. Aren't they equal in value to the owner? Or else why would you trade it? Because you would ask for a different Well, no, if, if, if we both agree to trade the apple for the orange, we know for sure that the, uh, the one who receives the orange wants it more than the apple, and the one who receives the apple wants it more than the orange. Other, otherwise, we can't explain what happened. It wouldn't, make, it wouldn't make no sense. So they're not equal. They're not equal. If I give up an orange to get an apple, that tells you, as an observer, he must have wanted the, uh, what, did, what did I say? <laughs> he must have wanted the orange more than the apple, or vice versa. I lost myself in the... Yeah, we, we know this, as Mises would say, apodictically, or as Rothbard would say, apodictically. Now, I could later make a mistake and say, ah, why did I do that? I really, you know, you can change your mind later. We're talking always with, as we say, ex ante, right? At the moment of the exchange. It doesn't mean we're perfect and later on we don't think we made a mistake. Knowledge is always uncertain. The future is always uncertain. I could say, darn it, why didn't I keep that orange? I really do, I did, you know, I wish I could go back in time and, and not do that. But th that doesn't affect the point. The point is at the moment of the exchange, as you see me making it, you have no choice but to conclude that I want what I'm getting more than what I'm giving up and same for the other person. Assuming I don't have a gun to his head, right? I'm not, he's not being compelled to, uh, to make the trade. Okay, we know this. So, so and this, now this ties in with labor, obviously. If I'm agreeing to do an hour worth of labor for an X, X amount of money, I want the money more than any other way I could have expended that hour of time. Okay, I'm going to establish that. Now let's talk about labor in a market. Let's leave Crusoe's Island, and um, we may, although we may return to it because it offers some useful um, examples, and, uh, and talk about now labor in a marketplace. And, and I want to stress now I'm talking about a free market. I'm talking about laissez-faire. Okay? The government is not trying to rig the game either for employers or employees, for business or for workers. It's really a free market. It's just a neutral referee, okay, calling fouls when fouls occur, but not taking sides in the, and, and trying to favor one team over, over another team. So, uh, free market. So, I'll say a little more about how things, how, how things change in, you know, on the ground when the government is rigging the game uh, one way or the other. So, how do, uh, how, do, how do wages get decided? How does labor get, quote, allocated? And I put quotes around that because labor, in a sense, labor is not allocated. People decide what they want to do, right? We don't, in, a, in a free market, you don't have a central authority assigning people to jobs as, as they did in, the, uh, in some totalitarian systems, or I guess all totalitarian systems. So, so we can talk about allocation in an economic sense, but you know what I mean. People freely wake up in the morning at some age, or any age, and say, any age once they're adults, and say, uh, you know, what do I want to do? How, how, how can I make more income, or what's, what do I think is going to be a more interesting career or job? I mean, so in that now, but it's allocated in the sense that the price system does uh, provide incentives, just like it does for other things. So the wage system will, which wages are prices, right? The price system, which includes wages, will offer incentive to to to, to, to potential workers to do one thing rather than another, and like, and we all take some cue from prices, including wages, in deciding what to do. It doesn't compel you. People are perfectly capable of deciding to take a lower income, lower wage, because hey, they like the work better, or they like the other conditions, or they like the town, or whatever. I mean, there's the, 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 another way Austrian uh, economics uh, differentiates, differentiates itself from other economics is that we don't look at in the individual human being as just a sort of Maximize, profit max, money maximizer. Money's not the only thing. Okay, Austrians, are, when they talk about ends, we're using that in the, mo in the bro most broadly abstract way. Ends are whatever it is you pursue. Money's not the only thing people pursue in the real world. So Austrian economics acknowledges that. So a person is perfectly capable 
of saying uh, it's a little less money, but I like that job better, it's more satisfying, or whatever it is, whatever the reason. So it doesn't mean people only go uh, for you know, what, what, what produces the highest uh, wage, let's say. But that doesn't mean they totally ignore that, and they do use wages, and, uh, uh, just like they use other prices, as a guide to, to action. <clears throat> Okay, one thing to acknowledge about labor is that it is not homogeneous. Okay, skills differ. If you're good in one thing, it doesn't mean if, it doesn't mean you are good in something else automatically or just as good. Okay, this uh, it's not a homo labor is not a, like a homogeneous lump of stuff that's undifferentiated. Okay, people are different. People have uh, different uh, talents, uh, and and so. There, the, the, the lay, there's not one labor market. This is a very important point. There's not one labor market. There are, in effect, many labor markets. Well, and while um, labor is not um, completely homogeneous, there, as I said before, people still are capable of moving among different types of works. They're at work. And this, this differs person to person. Some people are multi-talented, could do lots of kinds of work, and be you know, fairly competent at all of them. Other people, much less so. So the, you get this whole range. Uh, Mary Rothbard wrote a very interesting essay some years ago, which you can find, called Egalitarianism as a Revolt Against Nature. And what he was trying to point out there is that any philosophy that begins with a, uh, the idea that people are essentially just carbon copies of each other is going to be a mess. It's going to be a wreck. Because it's denying something very important about reality. We look around and we see differentiation, not just not only among people, but among things out there. Things are different, right? There's trees, there's rocks, and there are people who are different in all kinds of ways. So we just need to acknowledge that. The market understands that, takes it into account, and it's reflected in, in wages and, and in other ways. So it's not totally homogeneous, but, there is in a, but it's also not totally specific. People are capable within some range, and it varies from person to person, of moving among different kinds of uh, jobs, different kinds of work, and um, and so that you got to remember that that will be reflected in in the wages. <clears throat> because there is this, uh, there is some ability to move among different kinds of jobs. We can say that labor markets are interconnected to some extent. I mean, in a, in a market, if you really look at it closely, all markets are somewhat are, are connected. There's this expression about, uh, you know, what's that got to do with the price of tea in China, right? Somebody tells you something and you say, it's like a, like a slang for why does that matter? Well, in a sense, everything ultimately does affect the price of tea in China, right? Every, in, a, in the marketplace, everything is connected, in, at least remotely, okay? Not necessarily tightly and uh, immediately, but everything's connected to everything. If somebody brings on a new product on the marketplace, he hires workers, he needs to hire workers to, to start his new, uh, his new line of pro product which had, never, which had never been offered before, he's got to bid them away from something else. Well, that has some effect on the company that's now seeing its workers leave to go to the new place, right? He now has to go maybe find some, find some work, new workers, train them, which is going to have some effect. You know, there's always ripples, ripples uh, going out wider and wider and wider. <clears throat> labor also, so labor competes against labor, but it labor also competes against other factors. At, at some price, a, uh, a company may find it's worthwhile to reduce the number of workers and put in more machines, where that can, ha where that can be happen. So workers are competing against machines. We all know about this. We've all heard of the Luddites, right? The, the beginning of the industrial age. Uh, workers saw new machines, like in textiles, as threatening. So they smashed them, right, under the leadership of, what was Robert Ludd, was it? Uh, I think Robert Ludd. They went in with hammers and <laughs> smashed the machines. And, of course, we have that mentality today, don't we? We have this idea that anything that destroys jobs is bad. I recommend a book to you by uh, Brian Kaplan uh, called uh, The Myth of the Rational Voter. I think it may come up in a, did you already, did it, was it already spoken, did you have a public choice lecture already? Yeah. Did he mention this book? Okay, it's worth looking at. One of the prejudices he identifies uh, in this uh, uh, book, and it helps motivate voters, is that people think um, anything that destroys a job or makes a job go out of existence or say even leave the country is, b is bad, automatically bad. Uh, and if you trace that out logically, you'll see how absurd that is because it would mean we should be saving, we should still be making buggy whips and, uh, you know, we should have lots of blacksmiths because 
you know, what happened to all those blacksmiths when the, the horse got replaced by the car and the tractor? Uh, they, they all lost their jobs. It's terrible if people lose their jobs. Why should they have to change? Uh, if, you if you trace that out logically, you'll see the horror that would result. It would mean that consumers would never be allowed to change their tastes in anything. Because changing tastes could cause a whole industry to disappear. Uh, what happened to the slide rule makers? I don't hear any sympathy for the slide rule makers. Uh, somebody actually knows what a slide rule is. Sometimes I say that to a group that I don't even know what I'm talking about. Slide rule. And, so, you know, pay phones are pretty much going the way of the dinosaur, right? Because we all carry around one of those things. What about all those people who made pay phones? Or the operators. Remember the operators pulling all... You've seen it in the movies, right? Where they're pulling the wires out. What happened to all those people? So, uh, if we really would take seriously that any time, anything that destroys a job is, is bad news and we have to make sure it doesn't happen, you can imagine what kind of society uh, we'd be living in. <clears throat> okay, and, and I'll say a little bit more about that. I've got to watch the time. There's a lot to cover here. All right. So let's talk about wages. How are wages formed? Well, I don't know whether this has already come up, but uh, you're familiar with this. X marks the spot, right? It's a supply-demand curve. Curve. Which one slopes downward? Demand. Yay! Everybody gets, everybody gets an A for that. Right? <laughs> this is price or wage, and this is quantity. But we're, again, we're not talking about uh, a, a commodity in the sense of wheat, right? Where wheat can be sort of undistinguished, right? It's homogeneous, right? One bushel could be, for all practical purposes, for everybody in the world, identical to another bushel. We're not talking about that. Now we're talking about people with skills. So that's why I said there's not one labor market. One of the big mistakes that Keynes made when you, when you look at his stuff, of, uh, especially about around uh, what co in, not what causes depressions, but in analyzing a depression and getting out of depressions, he treats the labor market as if it was one thing. There's one labor market. Uh, and there, we, that, that is wrong. Uh, if you do that for convenience, then it's silly because... It, it, it's not a convenience. It wipes out all the detail that you're trying to study. So it's, it, that can't be very convenient to do that. There are many, many labor markets. So this doesn't stand for one. The la There's not one wage. There's many, many wages. But wages like prices are decided on, on a market as a result of supply and demand for that particular thing. So now we can ask what, uh, what creates... What, what are the factors that uh, account for the supply and demand for, say, a particular kind of labor? Well, it ends up, of course, going back to subjectivism and ultimately the subjectivism of the consumers. Because, again, we're talking about, just like I said, the person working in an, an iron ore mine. If, if there was no value for things that iron ore end up, uh, ends up producing, then, then uh, no one would pay to mine iron ore. Right? So, so the skills have to be somehow linked to things that the consumers uh, want. So when you're, a person hi is hiring a, a worker, he's got some considerations in mind. First of all, he's, he's going to uh, have some idea of what, that, uh, what revenue that person's going to add uh, to the firm. By bringing on this additional person, now we're doing marginal analysis, right? We already you had a discussion on marginal analysis, right? You're never buying a whole supply of stuff, including labor. You, you're, you're always looking at, uh, okay, if I bring on one additional worker, what can I expect the revenue to be, the profits to, to be from adding that person? Okay, you're, you're, that's the margin. You're at the margin. Should I hire the new, new person or not hire the new person? And what's going to be the incremental increase in my revenues or profits as a, as a result of bringing that person on? So that's the first thing an employer is going to be wondering about because he needs to know whether it's worth paying uh, anything to the person or... By knowing, having some idea what the additional uh, revenue uh, uh, amount is going to be, it's in Australian economics or economics they call the uh, marginal revenue product or dis discounted marginal revenue product, and I'll say something about the discounted part of it because it relates to the exploitation theory. Um, that's going to set the ceiling, right, to how much he can pay a worker. If a, if a worker is, uh, he estimates a worker is going to bring in an additional $10 an hour, equivalent of $10 an hour in uh, profits as a result of bringing this person on. Is he going to hire him for 11 or 12 or above that? Why would he do that? He's paying 12 to get 10. We know, again, from our praxeological discussion, the discussion of human action, people don't knowingly pay 12 to get 10. 
Okay, we would, if a person was doing that, we would say, well, he's obviously not engaged in economic activity. He may be doing it for some other reason. He may be playing a game, or it's a ritual, or some, something. But it's not economic activity, because you don't pay 12 to get 10. So, so he's got a ceiling, 10. What's going to be the floor? He might like to pay him for zero, right? He'd love if the guy, the woman, was willing to come on for uh, nothing, but, but also work hard as if he was person was getting paid. But that's not likely, right? That's not likely. So he rules that out. Uh, okay, maybe he'd like to pay one. I'll pay one to get ten, right? Everybody pay one to get ten? Uh, but what's going to determine if he can pay one? He can ask, he can say the wage is one. But of course he can't compel the uh, person to come to work for one. So now let's switch to the other side of the table, the worker. He's, um, he's got a floor and a ceiling too, doesn't he? In his... Uh, talking to the employer about whether to take this job. So what's the, um, what's his um, ceiling? I mean, he can come in and say, I want $100 an hour. Now the revenue is, the, the, the employer assumes the revenue is 10 from him, from hiring this person. He comes and asks for 100. Uh, why wouldn't the uh, employer automatically pay 100? Well, we're assuming there are probably people out there who are will, willing to work for less than 100 for a job that produces $10 in revenue. It's, it's a little unlikely one guy is going to be able to demand 100 for a job that's producing, or that's going to bring in $10. So that puts the limit on what the worker is going to ask. He'll probably have a sense that if I ask for 100, I'm not going to get 100 because the guy's going to probably find, the employer will probably find somebody who's willing to take, you know, 90. <laughs> you know, even that's still pretty high for a $10 a job that produces ten dollars in value. So he's got a he's got a ceiling somewhere that's set by the, his competition, other people willing to take that job and capable of taking the job. But why does it require any other competition? I mean, if he's the only guy left in the world, he's still like a hiring if he's charging fifteen. Well, okay, good point. That's right. The, so he's the, the consumer is ultimately put, setting the ceiling for the worker. Uh, that's, a, that's an excellent point, and it's a good time to mention this. The ultimate boss in all this is the consumer, when you think about it, okay? Because it's the consumer, by his choices to buy or not buy, that uh, put constraints on, on both sides of the ledger. That's right. So even if he's the only worker in the world and he asks, asks for 100, uh, you know, the business doesn't have to continue operating. I mean, he could just say, okay, I can't, I can't find a... And then let's say I he says, I won't take anything less than 100 because I can do something else. That might be a sign that this business shouldn't exist because he can't find anybody to, to, to uh, work less than 10. Employers aren't will, I mean, uh, consumers aren't willing to pay 100 or more. So that may be a signal that this company shouldn't even exist. So fair point. I take the point. Well, what's going to be his, uh, what's his, going to be his floor? What's the workers, what's he not going to go below? Well, his opportunity costs, which are presented by uh, other employers or any self-employment opportunities he may have, or maybe he's got a big bank account and feels, I don't need this job, I can, uh, I can live off my savings for a while. He's got a trust fund from a, <laughs> a wealthy grandparent or something like that. Um, so there, there's, a, there's, a, there, there's a floor that he himself, I mean, the average person, won't be able to go below. And that, and that will be, uh, most likely it's going to be what some other employer is offering him. So no, I'm not going to take five because I can get six across the street. Okay, so th this is a you know broad outline. There can be lots of individual variations. <clears throat> uh, so the thing that's driving this is cons com consumers in a competitive environment. Yes. So like with the consumers in the competitive environment and employers, isn't like the part of shopping around in a free market? Like you can evaluate the cost and the expenditures, and then your income that an employer would give you, and then weigh any other ulterior benefits that you get from it. Like well, the, the particular point about benefits, like health care, uh, health insurance, comes out of a kind of a quirk of American history. During World War II, there were wage and price controls, so companies could not offer higher cash wages to attract workers. Uh, they just couldn't by law, so we have a government intervention there. It wasn't a pure market. But somebody came up with the idea that, okay, I can't offer you higher wages, Maybe I can offer you non-cash benefits, like, like um, you know, I'll buy you a health plan. So they had to ask the government, 
They said, uh, the IRS or the Treasury, they said, uh, is this legal? Does this violate the wage controls if I offer a non-cash benefit like uh, health insurance? And um, it seems like that, that's an arbitrary decision, right? That could have gone either way. Obama's now talking about taxing health benefits. I mean, it is a form of pay. It's just not cash. It's just, a, you know, the employer is sending the cash to someone else, and that, that someone else is now giving you a service, which means paying cash to a hospital or a doctor someday. So it's still cash. It's just indirect, right? The government said, no, it doesn't violate the wage controls. So that kind of put us in the nail. That created the tradition, which endures until this day, of offering non-cash benefits because they're not, uh, they're not taxed. They're pre-tax, right? They're pre-tax dollars. At the moment, you don't have to declare them on your income tax return. So that, like I said, that could change. Uh, of course, it, it means you're getting less cash you're getting less cash. You have to assume cash is being adjusted. If you're paying a lot of non-cash benefits, cash has to be coming down to some extent. And it depends, I think, on the exact labor market, how elast how, uh, what the elasticity is for that form of labor. In some cases, um, the, worker, the, the worker may be paying 100% or almost 100% of his health benefits. Uh, he just doesn't think of it that way, right, because it's not on, a, on his pay stub. In other labor conditions, the employer may have to absorb it because of the whatever the, because of the competitive conditions. He may find he's got to absorb more of it, which means employing fewer people. And there's always ramification. That's the thing, you know. Anytime the government grabs one part of the balloon, it's just going to pop out somewhere else. Okay, that's a very important thing to keep in mind because people say, "Oh, why doesn't the government do this?" And they never look to the future secondary, tertiary, and so on consequences. They just look. It's the old seen and unseen that Frederick Bastiat wrote about. If you read. It's not in the law, but if you read his uh, essay, the scene, what is seen and what is not seen, uh, that's his whole point. If you only look at the immediate effects, to say the group of workers you're now, you know, have right in front of you, you think, okay, uh, it's only benefit. It's all benefits. Why not do this? Well, of course, it's only, it's, everything's all benefits if you never look at the costs. Everything looks rosy if you don't look at costs, sure. But Bostiat says, and Henry Hazlitt, this is Henry Hazlitt's lesson in economics in one lesson, if you look beyond those immediate effects to the immediate group, you're going to see lots of costs. So if, uh, the policies that look good when you have tunnel vision don't look so good the moment you broaden your vision to include other groups. So, like I say, you grab the balloon, and if you're not looking, you miss the fact that it's popped out there. So you're not, you, you, you want to get a full picture. Okay, so this is a, probably a good time to talk about some interventions since we're talking about this uh, where this uh, supply and demand intersect. And you have a sense now of what goes into, what goes into creating uh, 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 the wage because of the considerations that both the supplier uh, and the demander uh, has to make. So this, this is what we, you know, is known as the equilibrium point, of course. Supply equals demand. Anybody who wants a job at this wage, who's, you know, otherwise qualified, uh, can find the job, right? Because supply and demand are in balance and harmony in equilibrium. But if the government passes a minimum wage law and says the wage can't fall below this, and this is the market clearing wage, you got a problem because you got demand now here. Demand's fallen, right? Quantity. Supply is here, demand is here. So what happens when you have uh, something that's unsold uh, on the market and, we, and it's labor? It's called unemployment. It's a surplus. We've got a surplus of workers. They can't find jobs at this way, at the new wage. Because the quantities are out of whack. Here, see, the quantity was in harmony. So that's what happens when you pass a minimum wage. This is also what happens when a union is able to get the government, with government power, to able to force the wage above the market clearing wage. They may help a few of their own workers, right? Some, so their members may get higher wages. But there may be fewer people hired in that company or that industry. And then there's another effect. The people that can't find the jobs at the higher wage have to go into areas where the, the intervention is not as great, or maybe where there isn't intervention, which means more workers are now flowing into some new area, and that's going to depress the wage there, isn't it? Because you've got new workers coming into an area without there being a demand increase. So the result of getting higher wages for their workers in a, a particular union one consequence of their, get, of their helping their workers is they're hurting a whole bunch of other workers. And so it's, there's, there's not truly worker solidarity in a sense, in a, in a case like that, right? It's like my little group is doing better, but only because we've made all you worse off. That, hard, that doesn't sound very no, noble, does it? 
You don't usually speak that way. You don't usually say, I'm going to get higher wages by crushing those other workers over there. Doesn't sound too good. Okay, let's say something then about the exploitation theory, now that we're, it seems to be at a good point. Okay, Marx's idea was that if value comes out of uh, labor, and the laborer is not getting the full value of the product, he doesn't get the whole purchase price of, the, say, the car, someone else gets it, the, the employer gets it, uh, he must have been exploited. So, Bomberwerk showed that uh, Marx has left of some things out of the story. When, when a, uh, somebody goes to work for, a let's say, a car company, where there's some time that's going to pass before, between the, uh, the, the making of the product and the final sale of the product. Uh, okay, some time has to pass. The time is valuable, right? Time is money. I don't know if you've already had a discussion of interest rates. I guess it's going to be in the, uh, the business cycle the, uh, uh, lecture. The reason there is a phenomenon known as interest is that people uh, would rather have goods and money sooner than later. Okay, if you have a choice between, if I, if I say $100 now or $100 next week, I know what you're going to say. I mean, other things equal, and I almost can't think of an exception to this, you're gonna, you'd rather have the money now, or even the good now, rather than next week. Other, other things, as we always say, other things equal. I mean, if there's not some offsetting, offsetting if there's no benef something, uh, benefit that uh, would actually make the thing more valuable in the future, in other words, if you, if you and your subjective evaluation regard the present good and the future good as equal, you're going to take, the, going to take it in the present. There'd be no point in waiting. So, waiting and def or deferring uh, receipt of a good or money is worth something. Usually you have to pay someone to do it, right? If, if I want to use your money for a year, and I'm not talking about friends now where they make interest-free loans to each other, but I'm talking about you know strangers or just in the marketplace. Uh, if you want to use somebody's money for a year, you're going to need to compensate them. And that's, that's interest. Well, if, if you're going to start making a good at this point in time, and it's not going to sell until this point in time, uh, someone's going to be waiting. Workers who go to work in a company, car company let's say, uh, probably are not going to want to take that deal. I'll hire you to make cars but you don't get paid until we sell the cars. You're probably not going to find employers willing to do that, employees willing to do that. They, they want, like me, I want to check every month or every two weeks or something like that. So, so in other words, I want, I want an advance on the money, don't I? The worker is getting an advance on the money because the money hasn't come in yet. It hasn't, the product hasn't been sold. Some things can take a very long time to build, sometimes, some less. So the question is, if the, if the worker is not going to do the waiting, there's only one other person to do the waiting. That's the, employ, the employer. So the question that Bomberg asks is, given this uh, rule of uh, time preference, and that, that's, that's what Austrians call it, time preference, I guess economics generally talks about time preference, the preference for f present goods over future goods. Uh, if, if given time preference, if the, why would the worker be entitled to the full final purchase price of the good if time is going to be passing? He's, he's entitled to a, that amount discounted, right, by the interest, more or less by the interest rate. Some discount of that final good, final amount, because he's not willing to wait. It's as almost as if, well, it's not almost as if, this is what happens. The employer is making an advance to the, uh, to the worker on money not yet received. So it makes sense that that would be discounted by, roughly by the, the rate of discount, which is the, you know, an interest rate. So this is an answer that Bombavar gives to the exploitation theory. It can't be exploitation if the worker did not, not, does not have a claim to the full final undiscounted amount since he was not willing to wait for it. And so that's, that's the response that Bombavar made. Uh, and uh, I, maybe some people have tried to answer that. I, I'm not aware of a, of a, uh, a decent answer to that point, and I, so I have a feeling that that has stood the test of time. He, he wrote this in the uh, 19th century, late 19th century. Uh, okay, so what can we say? Let's talk about now um, what some of, some of this, how some of this transforms when government is intervening in the economy. I've been pretty much talking about 
how things work in a free economy. But we've never seen a free economy, unfortunately, as, as I said the other night. Uh, and I, by that, I don't draw. I don't draw from that that it, it can't exist. I do. I do believe there can be uh, free economies. It's just that the powers that be have never wanted them to exist. They've always had an interest in intervening. Governments and their clients and their you know the close the people they're close to uh, in the, out in the in the economy uh, have an interest in intervening. There are particular benefits that you can get. I mean, the libertarians have long talked about you know there's two ways. They've long talked about the two different ways to to gain wealth. There's the, the economic means. This is where you produce and and trade the people in the uh, marketplace. And of course, you have to get their consent, right? You have to persuade them. You can't compel them. But there's also the political means to get wealth. Political means means you use the state to tax people and then give you the money, or that's the most obvious way, but there's lots of subtle ways. For instance, put, put quotas and tariffs on foreign goods, and that lets you, the domestic producer, raise your price and get more out of the consumers. That's like a tax. It's just an indirect, subtle tax, but it's a tax. So the government has a variety of ways of getting wealth from people, not by consent. And the, historically, they've done it in order to benefit a certain group that they need support of. And uh, more or less historically, since the industrial age, it's been the business side, the capital side. This is why the other night I said the word capitalism is a bit loaded, because it seems to say, we like a system that favors capital. But if you're for the free market, you don't want to favor capital. You just want to favor freedom. So owners of capital and owners of uh, you know people who, are, who who live by their labor rather than in, uh, by by capital uh, are all free in the same respect, and so it's the system is not pro capital or pro business. Free market is not pro business. Walter Williams likes to uh, give a challenge to his uh, freshman students at George Mason University. He says, "I'll give you an A if you can find a single pro business uh, sentence in the Wealth of Nations." Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations. And I don't think anyone's ever gotten an A like that. Because Adam Smith doesn't say nice things about business people. There's a famous line where he says, I, I wish I could quote it directly, but he says, uh, it's, it's, it's never the case, I hope that's how he starts, that uh, businessmen get together for merriment, that the conversation doesn't turn to a conspiracy against the public interest. What he's saying, business people, when business people they get, get together, they begin to talk about ways to screw the public somehow. But he goes on, now, a lot of leftists like to quote that and say, see, even Adam, even Adam Smith realized that we need government intervention. But they don't read the next sentence, or the next two sentences. Because Smith immediately says, right afterwards, but there's no way to prevent this that's consistent with justice and liberty. And then the next sentence is, but, and the main thing is government should never facilitate or necessitate these conspiracies. Which, of course, is what government has done from time immemorial. It's facilitated, not only necessitated them, it's facilitated them. It's helped businesses get together. Historically, you know, companies have tried to get together to form cartels, right, to uh, reduce output, raise prices, and it would also hurt workers. Lower, it would be a way to lower uh, wages because these companies really wouldn't be competing with each other. And when they're left alone, the government doesn't help them, they fall apart. Like the, even like the, if you look at the OPEC uh, cartel, and those are governments. They're constantly cheating on each other, right? They, they come up with quotas. They assign quotas for how much uh, <coughs> oil each country will produce in the given year. And they have these big showy meetings where they do this. And then the next day, they're all out cheating each other because there's always more revenue to get by breaking the quota. And so the spot price is always well below the, the set price, the price that's set with great fanfare. The real spot price is lower. Well, the same thing with uh, gen general business cartels. They may make agreements to uh, cut back uh, production and uh, raise prices, but it's always tempting to cheat because you can make a little more money by breaking it. And plus, you also can't uh, control companies that are not in the cartel, right? Or some new company that starts up and says, I don't want to be in the cartel. I'm going to make all the profits you guys are uh, you know, trying to get by output uh, restriction. I'm going to expand output and make the money that way. So what are these, historically, what the cartel aspirants have done is turn to government to find ways, licensing, all kinds of ways to uh, make people stick to the cartel and not let any new company arise that's not going to be part of the cartel. The height of this came in the New Deal with the National Redu uh, Industrial uh, NIR, uh, the National Recovery Act, National Industrial Recovery Act. They forced companies into cartels. I don't know if you've read bo books like Amity Schley's uh, The Forgotten Man. She tells the story about this. They, they created compulsory cartels in every industry. You couldn't be on your own charging what you wanted. 
couldn't undercut the cartel. You could go to jail. There's a famous case of a dry cleaner. He wanted to charge 35 cents in New York City to, to clean a suit. The prevailing, not the prevailing price, the compulsory price was 40 cents. He went to jail for charging 35 cents. <laughs> cents, penny. We're talking about pennies here. Because the cartel price was 40. So people that want to cartelize, whether they're, whether they're unions or whether they're combinations of companies, always have to turn to government if they really want to make it stick. Because competition always erodes those things. Where there's freedom, there's going to be an erosion. So, historically, before the labor laws come in, the, uh, the laws tended to favor business. And you can kind of understand why. If you're a politician, you're going to want to have good relationship with employers, especially the big companies, the big corporate elite, the, the major companies, the Morgan, Rockefeller. They were always very influential all through the 19th century into the 20th century. In fact, if you read a book by a, a very interesting historian named Kolko, who, who by the way is not... Anybody know Gabriel Kolko? Hear the name? He wrote a book, his best known book is called The Triumph of, Con of Conservatism. Now he's, he's like a Marxist new left historian. So he's not out to uh, defend laissez-faire. But he tells a very interesting story that as the 19th century was coming to an end, the marketplace in the United States was vigorously competitive in all industries. Uh, new companies, nothing to stop new companies from popping up and taking market share from established companies. There was very little intervention. There was some state intervention. At the federal level, there's not a whole lot. In shipping and railroads, there is. You get the, you have the Interstate Commerce Commission set up in uh, uh, 1887. But at the federal level, there's not a whole lot of economic regulation going on. And there is some at the states, but still, it's still a, a largely free, probably the freest market the world had seen. And so big companies could not be sure that every day they, their market share was nice and stable because upstarts could come in. There was hardly anything to stop an upstart company from coming in. There was no income tax. You know, you, you didn't have government taxing away people's capital. And, and so the companies like Morgan, the Morgan interests who, who created U.S. Steel, they began to, uh, they would buy up other companies and then they would try to form these big conglomerates. They would consolidate. And those were losing market share. U.S. Steel became, was the first billion dollar corporation in the world after buying up uh, other steel companies and it, lo it was losing market share after the consolidation. And this was true of others too, yes? I have a question about, like, about the corporations. Were they state sanctioned? Yeah, there was corporate... Um, by then there was general incorporation. Uh, corporations begin as a, as a favor, right, to a particular person in the days of uh, mercantilism and the kings. But, but in the U.S. and in England probably at this time, incorporation becomes general. Any, anybody basically is eligible. You just have to file the papers. It was no longer... I mean, there is the issue of limited liability and stuff like that, which I, I don't have time to go into. But, but as far as anybody being free to incorporate, yeah, you could, you could do that. So these companies and the big, the big corporate elite, realizing that market methods didn't work in maintaining market share, turned to the government. And all the reforms that are known as the progressive era reforms in the U.S. from the late 19th century up to, say, 1914 or 1917, the Federal Trade Commission, the Federal Reserve Act, uh, there's a whole bunch of them, even the income tax, were supported and pushed by the corporate, the main corporate actors in sort of, in league with the progressives. In other words, they were themselves were progressives. Now, why were they? Was because they were anti-business? No. The whole point is these things were not anti-business. These were pro-big business. This was a way of business free. Uh, big business uh, it was a way for them to freeze their position, protect themselves from upstart small companies and foreign competition. By the way, you know the antitrust laws come in here. Then you, you you would think, okay, the antitrust laws they must be the result of anti-business. You know, left wingers, intellectuals trying to smash business. No, you have a whole segment of business that wants antitrust laws. Antitrust laws had a, played a couple of different roles. First of all, even today, most antitrust actions are by one company against another company. It's not the government coming in against the company. It's one company going crying to the government, saying, I want to file an antitrust act because they're competing too vigorously with me. They're undercutting my price, or they're, 
you know, they're doing something. It's a, it's a way for one company to throttle another company. The Microsoft case was filed by other cases, uh, Sun Microsystems and I forget who else. Nets, Nets, whoever owned Netscape at the time. <clears throat> Maybe it was just called Netscape. Uh, so these, pro these uh, uh, regulatory agencies were the product of, of, the, of business. And the intellectuals were there too, because they thought as the 20th century was coming up, this was the new way, right? They never liked the little government anyway. They always wanted, uh, the, they always had the planning mentality. I think they probably thought they'd get some good jobs out of the situation, right? They'd be part of the planning bureaus. So there was a harmony of interest among businessmen who didn't want new competition constantly nipping at their heels, taking uh, market share, and left-wing intellectuals, sort of state socialist intellectuals, who wanted the state to do more to manage the economy. There was a harmony of interest between these, these two points, these two uh, sides. And of course, people in government generally liked it too, because that meant more for them. More government, more power, more revenues. Uh, it was not the product of anti-business. It was anti-market, but it wasn't anti-business. And the regulatory agencies that weren't created by the government were uh, by, uh, created by business were ultimately captured by business anyway. Uh, there's a lot of uh, economic uh, literature by economists, uh, George Stigler is the big, big name in this, who, who documents how regulatory agencies get captured by the businesses that they regulate. Even if the business didn't want the thing in the beginning, which was often the case, they did want the regulatory agency, but even in cases where they didn't want the agency, they over in a short period of time, capture it anyway. After all, they're the ones that know most about the business, so they cultivate an intimate relationship with the regulators, right? They need, they, the regulators need information from them, they know the business, and it's just sort of one of these natural occurrences where the, the regulatory agency ends up almost being a representative of the regulated firm or uh, firms. So it's, the, it's known as the capture theory. Okay, I should wind down here so I can take Q&A. Let me just make sure there's nothing else I was going to say. Uh, let me reiterate, oh, so, so I should say something about labor laws. The labor laws come in beginning in the New Deal. Now, one, one of the misconceptions about these laws, like the Wagner Act, which sets up the uh, National Labor Relations Board and things of that nature, and uh, there's Taft-Hartley that comes a little bit later, one of the misconceptions that, seems, that all sides seems to uh, like to propagate is that Business didn't want labor laws. And by business now, I'm essentially meaning the big major companies, not the smaller independent ones, but the big established companies. And this, in fact, is not true, because for many years before the 1930s, before we get the Wagner Act, there were sort of upper-crust organizations. For instance, the American Association for Labor Legislation and the National Labor Federation. These were uh, not National Civic Federation. These were made up of sort of the upper crust of American society, which included sort of the top corporate elite, the philanthropists, you know, the, the people who were sort of the elite, uh, some of whom got there through, uh, you know, government measures and others just, in a, just because their families had wealth, whatever, whatever the reason. They were promoting labor legislation of some kind or another for decades before we actually get labor legislation in the 30s. Now, what would be their motive? Why would, why would a big businessman want labor laws. Well, think about what, when, what was going on in labor markets and in the labor movement before you get these laws. You had things like wildcat strikes. That's where a strike occurred without any notice, right? They just, in a particular plant, the workers, they may not have even have been formally organized, but maybe just sort of on an ad hoc basis, they just said, we're, we're walking off the job or threatened to walk off the job. No notice. There were also things like secondary boycott, boycotts and, and sympathy strikes. So you might not be having a problem in your plant, but to show solidarity with your you know, brother workers down the street, you go on strike in sympathy with their strike. Or secondary boycotts. You may organize a boycott of companies that buy, uh, buy from your company because you don't like the way the employers are treating you. So you go out and try to foment boycotts of him, of that guy, because he buys stuff from your employer. And it's a way of right, getting at your employer through a buyer of that product. In other words, there were all these sort of informal methods that, that uh, wild and wooly workers, and uh, uh, a lot of them were members of the uh, International Workers of the World, the Wobblies. You ever hear the Wobblies? This created a lot of strife in the marketplace. And you can see why certainly big companies and even smaller companies would, would say, you know, this is really crazy. 
we need to find a way to have labor peace. And one way that, the, the, like I say, the elite decided, the corporate elite, along with other elites in the society, was that if we could have government set the rules regarding labor, we would, bring, we would have labor peace. And that's essentially what they got with the National Labor Relations Board. A, a union cannot just go on strike. You can't just say, okay, you know, we'll come in one morning and say, all right, we're, we're picketing. There's cooling off periods. Even to get a union, you have to go through the NLRB procedures, right, to elect the union. There's, lots of, there's rules and certification. It's all been domesticated. You can see why the corporate elite would have wanted this, right? It's domesticating labor. And it's it brought to the and we, we basically have a corporatist type uh, system at, at at the point that all this is coming in. Certainly during the New Deal, you get almost a Mussolini style corporatism, right? You have the NRA forming cartels in every uh, industry. Everybody's got to sit down at the table. Well, the whole idea was, look, in order to keep union uh, peace with the workers, we don't want strikes just suddenly popping up. We don't want wildcat strikes, sympathy boycotts. Let's bring their leaders the ones that we regard as responsible and respectable, of course, let's bring them to the corporate table as junior partners. You know, they don't have quite the clout that the companies do. Bring them to the table. In other words, co-opt them. In the sense, co-opt them. And let's bring labor peace and, you know, kick the wobblies out, the radicals out. Let's, let's just anoint the responsible ones. And, and uh, there, were, there were labor uh, union or labor movement people who objected to things like the NR, uh, NLRB, and like a, the Wagner Act, and the, for, you, for, for the very reasons you can see that I'm laying out here. It was like, hey, we're being, we're being sold out, they would say. Our leaders are, are selling us out. <clears throat> and, and, you know, it's the, it's the government now who's deciding who the responsible leader is, not, not the people we decide. So it's not quite the story we're, we're, uh, we're usually told. Uh, one of the current controversies today is over the card check business, right? This, what's it called? The, employer, the Employee Free Choice Act. Uh, today, if you want a union, there's an election, uh, there's some options here, I know it's a little more complicated, but typically an ele a, a secret ballot election that the NLRB uh, oversees, it's got to be according, NLRB, has to be according to their procedures, and then they certify whether uh, the workers have, by a majority vote, picked the, pick the uh, you decided they want the union. So there's a movement now to, uh, that the, the organized labor wants to get rid of the secret ballot. Uh, they they want to be able to just go around to the workers with a card and, and say, uh, you know, check this off, you, you want a union. And then you don't have to have the secret, secret ballot. If you get the 50% plus one, I guess the union's in, there's some compulsory arbitration involved. And you can see how this is an extremely contentious issue, right? The union is saying, hey, uh, uh, when we have elections, we're intimidated by the employers. And the employers say, uh, or the, and even some, a lot of workers say, uh, talk about intimidation, some big beefy guy comes to me, to me or to my house with a card and says, here, sign, sign this. Uh, is that actually free choice? You know, I'd rather have a secret ballot, right, when no one can, knows who, who I am and how I'm voting. So both sides very contentious. Well, you know, I guess if I had to choose between those two, I would stick with a secret ballot. However, we have to remember, we have to broaden our uh, focus here. This is all being done under the auspices of the NLRB. We're, we're saying, like, well, okay, how do we want the NLRB to conduct elections for unions? I don't want the NLRB to conduct elections, period. I don't think there should be an NLRB. So I don't want to really make a choice between what side of the umbrella of the NL, NLRB do you want to be under, this side or that side. To me, that's not a very satisfying choice. I want to deregulate the, right, the labor market along with all other markets. So that's where I think we need to keep our eye on the ball and not invest too much in this uh, fighting the card check because we're kind of missing the bigger picture. Uh, I'm going to stop there. There's a lot of other things I could say. It's a big subject. You know, people can take whole semesters on labor economics. So here I am trying to cram it in. Uh, so let's open it up to uh, uh, questions. And I will try to remember to repeat the question, but somebody remind me if I've forgotten. Yes? Um, I was kind of always taught in economics classes that employment, unemployment of about 4% is what so called natural. Well, it's right. something called the natural or full employment right. or the natural level. So, yeah. I guess is that true, or is? I mean, how do they determine that? Well, and I think they just determine that by observing, you know, what it's tended toward uh, over a long period of time, taking into account normal conditions, recessions, depressions, etc. I mean, at any given time, there's going to be some unemployment. Some people are going to be between jobs. Uh, 
because and our, our company closes and so people sometimes take some time to find another job that not it depends on your situation people don't always just rush out and find the first job they can find the the, the the free market theory is that there's in a marketplace there's no such thing as voluntary unemployment uh, meaning that if you're as long as markets can find their clearing level market clearing level for labor you're not going to have this phenomenon this is this is where you have uh, involuntary unemployment right people want jobs but they can't find them because the wage in the case of the minimum wage the minimum wage is uh, above the, uh, the market clearing level. So it's going to be some. And I guess just by observation over time, that has tended to be whatever it is, four or five. Now, the, uh, during the 90s, when there was a huge uh, increase in productivity because of the computer revolution, but also, I guess, Fed creation of money, people thought that the natural rate had now fallen to, what, three? It was, extreme, it was low historically during the Clinton years. Uh, and uh, Greenspan and others we talk about the new economy where the natural rate of unemployment now has dropped to three something rather than four, between four and five or whatever it was. But wouldn't the optimum rate of unemployment be zero percent because those who didn't want to work wouldn't be measured at the unemployment? Well, I, I, I don't see any reason to talk about optimum. If the market's free, then people are making decisions according to their what they think is their best uh, options about things. and. I wouldn't want to call any particular level optimum. There's going to be, uh, there's always going to be some. Like I say, people uh, want jobs, but they're taking their time to find uh, the, the thing they want. Uh, the way they count unemployment now, if you're not looking for a job, you're not counted. So they already, they already take those people out. Uh, but, you know, if you've stopped looking because you've become, uh, you know, hopeless, like in a case of intervention, let's say, should you take those people out or, should you, or shouldn't you take them out? It seems funny to take them out. They've only given up because they've lost hope, not because they don't feel like working. So, you know, I'm not sure that's... And, and people have criticized the unemployment, uh, the way they do, do the collection of data for that reason. Did you have one question? Somebody have a question? I saw a hand. Um, like you, you started first about how labor's not homogenous, like, you know, commodity goods, and how there's different labor markets for everything. But, like, for you, for instance, you, I, I assume you'd be, like, a college Well, it just goes into my calculation. Oh, yeah, sorry. See, I violated that right away. I probably violated it here, too. Uh, okay, so the question is, uh, if someone is capable of doing a few different things, how does that go? What was, how did you put it? How did it well, you're, you're in several different labor markets. How does that affect your wage? How does it affect my wage? Well, it, it affects my wage in what I can ask for or how I decide, what I decide to accept. I mean, I, uh, if I'm offered a particular wage to edit the magazine here, and um, other things being equal now, because that's a different, I might like that work better than standing in front of a class day in and day out, assuming that was an option open to me. Uh, I have to weigh these things. Uh, let's say, uh, you know, someone's going to pay me double what I'm now making to, st to every day stand in front of a class. I may think, well, double, that's hard to turn down. Uh, so it just, it just uh, it complicates my calculations but it's just still part of the calculations. The magic words here are opportunity cost. Someone said it earlier. That's one of the key concepts to take away from this uh, week. I mean, there's a few key concepts. Spontaneous order, the things that, you know, once you hear about them, you say, oh, sure. But you don't, you don't always think of them until you've kind of, you know, been walked through it. Um, that's, that is the, the key thing that's moving people day to day. Because the opportunity cost is is what are you foregoing by accepting, you know, choice X or A? You know, what is B? What the, ch the cost of A is B, your second ranking thing, right? If I go into a store and spend a dollar on a candy bar, we you know we tend to think the cost was a dollar, right? Someone says, oh, what'd you, what'd you uh, pay? Pay meaning what did you give up for the, for the candy bar? You, your, your colloquial answer is going to be a dollar. But if you think about it for a moment, what you really mean is what else you could have done with the dollar. Because first of all, the piece of paper in itself isn't of much value, and it's losing value all the time, or will be. Uh, someone the other day sent me a one, and Larry too, a $100 trillion bill. Unfortunately, it was drawn on the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe. So it's, it, I don't think it'll get me uh, 
a glass of water in a restaurant in Zimbabwe, but it's a $100 trillion bill. So it's, it's not the money itself you want, right? Money, money is a means of exchange. So what I, the question is, what do I give up by, by buying the candy bar? Maybe I would have had the slice of pizza or going across the street and bought something else. Maybe I would have held it in my pocket for a rainy day. That, that's a service, right? Having money for an uncertain time, keep it in my pocket. I've given, I've given whatever my next ranking, highest ranking option was, that's what I really give up. That's the opportunity foregone. And this leads me to an example about uh, labor. Uh, and this, this, uh, this uh, relates to foreign trade, too. I don't, I don't know if there's a particular talk on foreign trade. Should, oh, globalization. I think there'll be a talk on globalization. Yeah. Yeah, do you have it already? Yeah. Yesterday. Okay, so you know about uh, comparative advantage, then. Is that already discussed? Comparative advantage. But that works at the individual level, too. In fact, the example usually given is not in foreign trade, but an example of an in two individuals. So imagine, ma imagine a, uh, if this example was already given, you know, wait, give me a wave and I won't waste time. Imagine a lawyer who can make $500 an hour. He's a, very, he's a good lawyer. Is that, is that a high price these days, or maybe that's not high price? He's making $1,000 an hour. He's like the top lawyer in, his, in New York City. He can make a lot of money in an hour, lawyering. He also is a typist. He's a world champion typist. He's the world champion typist. It's a hobby of his. This is the days of the typewriter. Okay, let's go back in time. So he's not only super fast, he's super accurate, which is what it takes to be a good competitive typist. I think there were competitive uh, typing competitions in the old days. See, that all got wiped out by uh, word processors. So he can do both. Nobody does either one of those better than he does. So I'm going to ask you to make a prediction here. He's a, he's a, he has an office. He has a law firm and has an office. He types it better than anybody he could possibly hire. Is he going to hire a typist? Yeah. Why? Because of his opportunity cost. If he spends an hour typing, what's that costing him? $1,000. Well, let's say he's got to pay $10 an hour to hire a typist. It's costing him $1,000 minus 10. Are right, you saving the 10? But he's spending a thousand, or giving up a thousand, foregoing is the term, foregoing a thousand to make ten. Okay, and that's stupid. So he hires a typist, even though the typist, by, by stipulation, is going to be inferior to him as a typist. It's still worthwhile. This is an argument used in foreign trade, but I want to use it now in the labor market as well. People will hire people to do things even when they can do those things better, because they do something else even better. The typist does not have the same opportunity cost in spending an hour typing, there's a lawyer, right? The, the, the typist is not giving up $1,000 an hour to type for $10 an hour. The, type, the lawyer is giving up $1,000 an hour to save $10 by doing the typing. So they have a mismatch of opportunity costs, which creates employment opportunities for the typist. So th this, this filters through the whole labor market and, and helps create wages. But opportunity costs... Always look, ask yourself, how does the opportunity cost figure into whatever the situation is you're thinking of when you're trying to work out some economic problem? And more often than not, you're gonna, it's going to shed light on the situation. Okay, I'm, I'm doing way too much talking in the Q&A now. Yes? Yeah. <laughs> so what, what, is the, what is a worker's consideration when he chooses to join or not join a trade theory? What is this consideration? Well, that can vary individual to individual. <coughs> why some workers don't join? Union. And union representation in the private sector has been falling for many, many decades. Uh, it's very low. What is it, 7%? Uh, I think it's about 7%. And I'm talking about government now. Government's very high. Government workers, that unionization is solid. But in the, in the private sector, it's been falling for a very, very long time. So your question is, why would someone not join a union? Yeah. Well, when you... One reason may, could be that when you join a union, there's a whole set of rules there. Maybe, maybe you just don't want another set of inflexible bureaucratic rules. I mean, a union is not a business, so it's not, it's not working on the basis of uh, the, the, way a, the way a firm does in, in, in a free market now, not in an interventionist market. So it may come up with rules which seem kind of weird because they're, they're more bureaucratic than uh, economically motivated. There are a lot of rules say, you know, you can only do one kind of job. You know, there's, there's uh, you know, famous stories, crazy stories about someone who working, uh, maybe working in the theater behind the scenes, right, in the stage hand. Can't pick up a hammer. You know, need a nail hit very fast. Right now, the, camera, uh, the curtain's about to go up, right? They've got to do one quick fix. Oh, you can't touch the hammer because that, that's the province of somebody else, another kind of worker. Larry, are we going to add something here? Uh, because of 
policies of their unions, probably some of them are wishing they hadn't paid dues all those years. Well, that's a good point. You may not want to be a member because you don't like its policy and it may well drive the wage high enough where the, com the company has to close. Uh, and by the way, if there's a union in your, in your uh, company, uh, you know, NLRB blessed union, you still got to pay dues. You, you can choose not to be a member, but they still take the money from you. Now, theoretically, you have a right to, to not pay the money that goes to political organizing. However, that doesn't work out quite the way it was supposed to because, uh, you know, the books aren't always honest and you don't know how much money is going to political organizing. So it, you may actually be paying against your will to support candidates you don't like. It's a mess. That's why I say we need to deregulate the labor market, along with all the other markets. I wouldn't say only deregulate the labor market. We, we, we do want to deregulate them all. I think I've gone to my... We have time for one more question. Time for one more question. Ah, who's going to be the lucky one? There. <laughs> Do you think there should be an ideal age for, I mean, to, to be a part of the labor market? I'm asking this question with, with special regards to Africa because we have a lot of child labor. Yeah. So do you think that there's an ideal age to be a part, to be part of the labor market? Uh, nice question. That's a, that's a whole lecture in itself. Uh, uh, oh, yes. <laughs> is there an ideal age? Is that the term you use? Is there an ideal age when you can enter the labor market? Um, the questioner pointed out that in Africa there's a big issue with child labor. And of course, at an earlier time in our history, there was a, a big issue with child labor. Uh, that is an entire lecture or more itself. I wish I could say more about it. We had a lecture last week about sweatshops in developing countries. Uh, typically, and now I'm assuming, you know, little or no government intervention. It complicates things when if government is really trying to manipulate things. But typically, children will need, will, younger people in the population, including children, will, out of economic necessity, have to be involved in, in work, usually it's agriculture, but, but work at an early stage of economic development, simply because nobody, they don't have enough capital goods and machines to enable one individual to produce enough income for a family. That's not the result of cruelty or exploitation, it's just the result of of nature. Imagine uh, if Crusoe was on the on the island with his family. Everybody probably has to work because there are no machines. He can't make enough income to feed, you know, a spouse and then you know one or two children. They would probably all have to to be working. Certainly, the kids at a certain age, kids in the in the agricultural society, go out and help harvest and things of that nature, and even do have done some factory work in the early days of industrialization. But that passes very quickly if. If the, if the uh, economy is allowed to develop freely, because as capital is accumulated and, and uh, there's better technology and machines, people can do, individuals can do more work. I mean, look how in a developed economy people move earth, right? We need to make a foundation for a new building. We don't have people going out with shovels in a developed economy where you would need like lots of people. I mean, think of how they built the pyramids in Egypt. They needed like a lot of people. Today, a couple people in these very fancy machines move, dig the whole foundation, you know, a couple of people. It's amazing. That comes from progress, freedom, accumulation of capital, being able to save and not have the government confiscate savings so that you can invest, and then technology, inventions. Uh, in the case of a developing country where you already have the inventions in the, in the developed world, you need foreign, foreign investment so that the you don't have to reinvent the wheel, right? Stuff that's already known about gets gets brought over to the developing country, that would, make, that would tend to make foreign um, child labor disappear relatively quickly if there's, if there's a free market, if the institutions are right. So that's the general answer. When you try to hurry that up, last week we had a very good, uh, and you can get the MP3, you can listen to it on our uh, website. Ben Powell gave a talk, economist Ben Powell gave a talk about sweatshops in the developing world. And he cited a study that came, I don't know if it was the UN or something like that, you know, some establishment study. In one of the countries, Sri Lanka or someplace, where they, uh, the government made an effort to, you know, they, they said kids shouldn't be working in Nike factories, they should be in school. So they, I think they forced the companies to make, you know, not em employ the children. This was supposedly done for the children's benefit. It turns out an awful lot of those children either turned to prostitution or just were killed in the streets. They were, they, they were living in the streets and were killed. Now they went from a, a better situation to definitely a worse situation. The motive might have been good, 
But motives, this is another important concept to take away with you. Intentions don't count in this, not in economics. I mean, they, they count in some way, maybe in some way in evaluating the person. But in, good intentions are not enough. That's the, that's the lesson. Good intentions are only the best of intentions. But given the laws of economics and, and human nature, you may get bad consequences from something that you have the best intentions for. So the best way to have kids not working in the developing world or, or any, anywhere, kids, I mean, you know, really young kids, is economic growth, uh, technological advancement, investment, increased advancement. And then kids won't be working because parents f won't send them off to work. There'd be no need to do it. I hope that gives you some, some answer. Like I said, that's a huge subject. But I think we have to end there. So thank you very much, and uh, I'll be back later.